All right, welcome everyone. Uh, let's make a start. We've got uh, quite a few people online as well, so let's um, move ahead. It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome everyone here today for our uh, seminar in the Dissel Seminar Series, which is being given by one of our uh, PhD students here at the Sea Lab in South Alabama. So Hannah uh, Ehrman is a PhD student in my lab and she's going to go through her prospectus presentation today. Yeah. So I'll hand over to Hannah. All right, um, well, thanks Ronnie for that introduction. Um, and as he said, today I'm gonna to be presenting my dissertation prospectus entitled An Historical and Predictive Assessment of Changes in Fish Communities of Nearshore Alabama. Um, and I'd like to go ahead and thank my uh, committee, Ron Baker, John Lairder, Sean Powers, and Mandy Karanaskis. Okay, so first I'm gonna be giving some introduction and background information, and then I'll get into the three chapters of my dissertation. Uh, the first chapter focuses on spatiotemporal community changes in Alabama nectin. Uh, the second looks at drivers of Cynosia nebulosus and Cyanops oscillatus growth. Uh, those are speckled trout and red drum, respectively. And my third chapter looks at environmental drivers of key species productivity. Um, but first, just the introduction and background information. So climate change impacts the functioning of estuarine ecosystems. Um, and it does this by changing the environmental conditions within the estuary. And you can see these associated impacts of climate change are represented in this figure, which was created by the NERS Estuary and Education Program. And they include water temperature, rainfall, sea, sea level, coastal storms, coastal currents, and freshwater inflow, which impacts nutrient flow into the estuary. So environmental conditions are a primary driver of species distributions and therefore strongly regulate ecosystem dynamics. Um, organisms live within their tolerance ranges of environmental factors such as temperature and salinity, and this is a primary factor in global species distributions. And because of this, changes in estuary and environmental condition can change species abundances, which in turn can change how the ecosystem functions. And while ecosystems can usually adapt or recover from these natural variations in environmental conditions, climate change is intensifying the variability of environmental conditions, which is driving several key factor, key environmental parameters in a single direction. So there are a lot of different scales that we can use to examine environmental variation. And if we look at daily or monthly time scales, we can see regular periodic fluctuations in the estuary. And this video, which is playing good, um, is of tides in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and it's a really perfect example of this. So this system regularly experiences huge tides and intertidal organisms in this region are adapted to living with these large tides. So these organisms can either move with the tide or they are able to experience really extreme changes in their environmental condition being intermittently covered by water. And another scale that we can use to look at environmental change is um, look at it annually where we can examine episodic events that temporarily disrupt environmental conditions and ecosystem functioning. One example of this, um, we can look at a paper written by Charlie Martin at all 2020, which examines changes in nectin communities before and after the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And just as a reminder, nectin refers to mobile organisms living in the water column. So this paper found that the nectin community changed after the oil spill in the years, um, between the years 2010 and 2012 and it recovered in later years. Um, it's important to note here though, that immediately after the oil spill, all commercial fisheries were shut down and this likely aided in the quick recovery of the nectin community in this situation. So the last scale for looking at environmental changes um, that I'm going to talk about today is long-term variation. And in this case, we're talking about um, single directional shifts through long time scales driven by the associated impacts of climate change that I mentioned earlier. And while changes in environmental condition affect organisms at all of these scales, um, my dissertation is going to focus on these long term effects. 
Okay, so why do these long-term changes in environmental condition affect organisms? Uh, it's because all organisms have ideal ranges for environmental conditions and limits to what conditions they can survive in. And there's um, luckily a significant amount of research testing these ranges in lab conditions for Im commercially important species. Uh, one example of this is uh, the picture shown here of green sturgeon larvae. So the larvae on the top was reared in conditions typical of its natural environment where the water was about 18 degrees Celsius. Um, but if you look at the two larvae on the bottom, they were reared in high temperature waters at 28 degrees Celsius. And the study found that the larvae reared in higher temperature water were more likely to have deformities. Um, and these two larvae on the bottom are an example of this. They both have spinal cord deformities. And if they had been born with these in the wild, um, this would have significantly impacted their ability to survive. So these physiological tolerance ranges translate into geographic species ranges. And one example of long-term environmental changes affecting species distributions is range shifts in organisms such as the gray snapper. So the gray snapper, like many other tropical associated organisms in the Gulf of Mexico, has been found in increasing abundances in the Northern Gulf. And the increase in abundance of tropical associated species is attributed to long-term sea temperature rise resulting from climate change. So these temperatures, in these sorry, these changes in species abundances ultimately change the community composition, which is the species found in the estuary. And when species composition changes, it can change, it can cause trophic cascades, uh, disrupt habitat building species, or reduce the abundance of economically important fishery species. So essentially, some small changes can cause a community wide shift that fundamentally changes how the ecosystem looks and functions. So in this presentation, I'm gonna focus on a few key fishery species, including a few sport fish, uh, speckled trout, red drum, and southern flounder. And these help support a large recreational fishery um, and engage, in, engage the public with marine life. I'll also be looking at a commercial fishery, which is panaid shrimps, and these support a huge economy as well as the livelihoods of many commercial shrimpers. Um, so one interesting thing about coastal Alabama is that it's a really ideal location to examine the effects of long-term sea temperature rise on estuarine organisms. And this is because marine nectin physically can't migrate any further northward. Um, this is likely to be an issue in future climate scenarios. Uh, we're not seeing too much evidence of that right now. But while there are populations of these same species migrating up the East Coast, the local populations will be unable to do so um, and will either need to adapt or die out. Um, so I'm extremely lucky because the Alabama Department of Marine Resources um, has had the fisheries assessment and monitoring program going on since 1981. And this program collects monthly trawl sane and gillnet samples throughout coastal Alabama. Um, so these are some really beautiful 40 year old data sets that I'm gonna use throughout my dissertation. And these are going to be paired with long-term environmental data from Arcos, USGS and other sources to identify environmental drivers of nectin community structure, as well as key species growth and productivity. So this dissertation is focused on understanding these long-term impacts of climate change on Alabama nectin. And I'm going to do this by uh, identifying what environmental factors drive changes in nectin community structure in chapter one, as well as drivers of key species growth and productivity in chapters two and three respectively. Um, so first I'll talk about chapter one, um, which looks at spatiotemporal community changes and Alabama nectin. And this chapter is focused on long-term changes in nectin communities influenced by climate change. And the aim here is to identify long-term trends in Alabama nectin community dynamics and identify any existing connections between community dynamic shifts and environmental condition. So by gaining a better understanding of what environmental factors have influenced abundances of nectin species in Mobile Bay in the past, um, we can hopefully better predict nectin community dynamics under future climate scenarios. 
Uh, Mobile Bay is a really dynamic estuary and it receives a high volume of freshwater inflow from high rainfall and the Mobile Tennessee Delta. It's also a relatively shallow bay aside from the shipping channel and regularly experiences hypoxia or periods of low oxygen. And if we look off to the west, the Mississippi Sound is also relatively shallow, but receives far less freshwater inflow by comparison. Um, so this video is a model created by John Lairder, Mark Van Moore, Lisa Lowe, Brian Dewankowski, and Juwang Liu. And it shows a time-lapse of modeled salinity throughout Mobile Bay in the year 2019. And the map on the left here shows bottom water salinity. The map on the right shows top water salinity. And salinity in these maps ranges from very low, shown in the dark purple, to relatively high, shown in that bright yellow. Um, so as I mentioned, Mobile Bay is strongly dominated by pulses of freshwater inflow, which you can see periodically throughout this video. And you can also very clearly see the bottom layer of more saline water that runs up through the shipping channel. Um, and if you're not familiar, uh, the shipping channel is, you can see it as, as that thin line of bright yellow that runs north to south in the figure on the left. So this freshwater inflow is very, a very important environmental factor in the bay because it brings in nutrients, which drives productivity. And while these pulses of freshwater inflow are short-term dynamics, um, there may be longer term trends in discharge that are important in this study. Um, so next I'm gonna go into the methods of chapter one. And the FAMP MRD program that I mentioned earlier um, has taken monthly, monthly trawl samples th throughout coastal Alabama. And those locations are in the map on the right. Um, the, they use a 16 foot otter trawl and this is left fishing for 10 minutes while the boat drives between two and two and a half knots. And again, these trawls have been done at these same, same locations since 1981. Um, for each trawl, all animals were identified to lowest taxonomic level possible, counted and measured. And a YSI water quality sonde was also used at each station to get a point measure of salinity, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. So as I mentioned earlier, there is regular short-term variation in the nectin communities, which coincides with natural environmental fluctuations resulting from seasonal variation and freshwater inflow pulses. But the focus of this chapter is looking beyond this at the long-term trends. Um, but to do this, I need to first identify those re that regular variation and account for it. Um, and essentially here, it'll look like noise. So to do this, uh, I'll first calculate univariate community metrics, including uh, the Shan, uh, diversity indices, the Shannon Weider diversity index and Hills N1, J prime evenness, species richness and biomass. And I will feed these univariate community metrics into a generalized additive model using environmental factors as explanatory variables. And the environmental factors will include temperature, salinity, discharge and dissolved oxygen. Um, I'm then going to use a smoothing parameter to examine the long-term trends and account for that seasonal variability. So this figure on the right is an example of a smoothing parameter being used at different levels. Um, and just for clarity, it's the model is the solid uh, line, not the dotted line. So as you can see, the, mo the models on the left um, include regular short-term variation, essentially that waviness that you see. Um, whereas the figure on the top right captures the overall trend, but excludes that short-term var variation or that waviness. Um, and so in addition to modeling these univariate metrics, I will also be examining how long-term trends in community composition and abundance um, as captured through multivariate methods. So I'll be looking at multivariate community structure using non-metric multidimensional scaling plots. And just as a reminder, these take multivariate data sets like community matrices and calculate points based on a similarity matrix. And in this case, I'll be using Bray Curtis. So in these plots, points that are close to each other represent multivariate data that is similar to each other. Um, I've included this example here where each point represents the organismal community from one site at one sampling period. 
And in this example, the community is clustered by site where the samples at site two are similar to each other and the samples at site sites one and three are in a separate cluster and are similar to each other. Um, I'm also going to run some post hoc tests on this MDS. Um, I'll first run an ANISM. And an ANISM is analogous to an ANOVA in that it tests for significant differences between a priori groupings. In this case, those groupings are going to be stations, regions, and years. Um, and I'm also attempting to use the SIMPROF procedure. And this groups points without a priori groupings to understand which samples are similar to each other regardless of where or when they were taken. Um, unfortunately, the SIMPROF procedure is very computationally difficult on the computer, and we have not been able to run this, even running it on a supercomputer, unfortunately. Um, but we're still working on that. And lastly, I will use the BioNV procedure to calculate Spearman rank correlations between the MDS and environmental variables. Um, and this is to help us understand which variables might be driving variation in the data. Um, so the last thing I'm going to do in this chapter is explore the multivariate community data in terms of functional diversity to see if environmental variables are impacting different functional groups. Um, so first, I just want to define functional diversity as the diversity of practical traits. And this means that instead of basing the diversity index off of the number of species in each sample, species are split up into functional groups based on traits such as feeding type, mobility, and reproductive strategy. So the organisms will be coded based on their functional group instead of their species. And as an example, I've grouped out some fish here based on their preferred feeding strategy. And the functional groups will look kind of like this, but they're going to combine other traits into the groups as well. So again, the organisms will be coded based, based off of their functional groups instead of their species. And I will run a multivariate analysis that is similar to the MDS I just talked about. Um, but because of the way I'm grouping the data by functional group, instead of an MDS, I will use fuzzy correspondence analysis and co-inertial analysis. But the resulting plot and post hoc analyses are pretty similar to the MDS, um, where I will plot the points produced by the co-inertial analysis. And again, those points close to each other represent communities that are more similar to each other. Um, the primary difference here is, again, just that this analysis is examining data based off of its functional groups. And so the interpretation is based off of functional diversity of the community, um, not the species present. Uh, and next, I'll get into the preliminary results of chapter one. So again, we used the um, Alabama Marine Resources Department Fisheries Assessment and Monitoring Program trawl data spanning from 1981 to 2018. And again, this is a very large data set. It's monthly data for almost 40 years, um, which makes um, interpreting the results fairly difficult. So to make the data more manageable, I took the average abundance for each species by year and only included the months of April through September in that average. Um, and this is to cover recruitment and times of high density, but exclude some of that seasonal variability. Okay, so this plot on the left is a non-metric multidimensional scaling plot where each point represents the nectin community at one station for one year. And I've included the station map on the right here for reference. Um, so the colors on both the map and the um, MDS both represent regions. Um, so the regions I grouped things out into are Gulf of Mexico, Mississippi Sound, North Mobile Bay, uh, South Mobile Bay, and the Perdido Wolf system. And you can see the ellipses plotted on the MDS and these represent the cluster analysis by region. So what we see is that the nectin communities are significantly clustered by geographic region. And this is that same MDS plot, but I have lifted out all regions other than Mobile Bay. So it only includes those points from upper and lower Mobile Bay. And the colors of the points here represent station rather than salinity. But we can see here that the nectin communities are also significantly clustered by station. So I'd like to point out a few stations. Uh, first of all, Station 8, which is a channel station in the lower bay, and Station 56, 
in pink is um, right next to station eight, but it is not in the channel. It is next to an oil rig. Um, and I find this kind of interesting because these stations are literally right next to each other in the bay, but they do represent different communities. Um, so just showing that there are different animals that live uh, in the channel than outside the channel. Um, and we've also got station three in red, which is also a channel station, but it, it is in the upper Mobile Bay. Um, and this again, groups out differently from the other upper Mobile Bay stations that it's relatively close to. Um, and lastly, I'd like to point out the Weeks Bay Station, Station 27 in yellow, and the Bon Secours River Station, Station 28, which is in brown. And these occupy almost the same space in the MDS, which indicates that these um, communities are very similar to each other, even though they're living in slightly different areas. So um, both of these plots are the exact same MDS. Um, the colors are just coded differently. So the plot on the left is that same plot I just showed where the colors represent stations. But in the plot on the right, the point color represents salinity instead, where the dark blue represents lower salinity and the light blue represents higher salinity. And if you look at the plot on the right, you can see that all of the low salinity samples or essentially stations are grouped out together while the higher salinity stations kind of radiate out to the right. And this indicates that low salinity nectin communities are similar to each other. And when we bring this back out to the larger MDS with all regions included, this trend still holds true. So again, the plot on the left is um, colors coded by region. The plot on the right is colors coded by salinity. And again, we see that low salinity nectin communities are similar to each other. So this is a heat map plot where each column is a dominant species and each row is a station. And the color or the, that grayscale of those boxes represents the average abundance of that species at that station throughout the study. Um, and I've also included the region names and average salinity at each station for reference. Um, so the station, just um, FYI, the stations here are ordered based on cluster analysis and the species are listed in order of highest abundance. So we can see two primary groupings here based on the dominant organisms. Um, the majority of the stations are dominated by anchovies, while a few gulf or near gulf stations uh, group out with few anchovies, but being dominated by sand dollars. And this is likely just because these stations are in or near the gulf rather than being on the sound side and are just sandier stations. Um, so I'd like to bring your attention back to the stations three, eight, and 56 that I mentioned earlier. Uh, again, station three is that upper bay channel station. Station eight is the lower bay channel station. And station 56 is the um, one that's right next to station eight. And you can see that all three of these stations are characterized by both anchovies and croaker. But only stations eight and three, those two channel stations, are also characterized by white trout and brown shrimp. Um, and neither of those is found in particularly high abundance at station 56, despite um, it being right next to station eight. So it's possible that these organisms are associated with the channel because they use it as some kind of salinity or temperature refuge, but at this point we can't be sure. So I've spoken a lot about the spatial trends of this data, but of course this analysis is also focused on the temporal trends. So the figure on the left is that same MDS that I've been showing, except that the points are color coded by year, where earlier years are darker and later years are lighter. And we can't really see any distinct patterns in the MDS um, and the communities relating to what year the sample was taken in. And what we found is that um, we really can't pick out any temporal trends using the MDS approach just in general. Um, however, if you look at the figure on the right, you can see the it represents the percent change in abundance of the most common species in this data set. And we're comparing the years 1981 and 2018. And there are some pretty drastic changes in abundance of the top species. Um, and this indicates that there are major changes in abundances of the most common species throughout the data set, um, but the MDS is just not, um, not identifying these. 
So we're exploring more analyses to better understand those temporal trends now that we've um, explored the spatial trends. Some additional next steps for this chapter include adding more environmental drivers. Uh, I plan to add the El Nino Southern Oscillation, river discharge, and nutrients as potential environmental drivers in this analysis. So this work ultimately identifies any environmental factors that cause these drastic shifts in abundance of the most common nectin species through time, as well as identifying any additional environmental factors that um, drive the spatial differences in community composition that we're already seeing. Um, and understanding which environmental factors most influence nearshore Alabama nectin will hopefully help us better predict how these communities might respond in future climate scenarios. So next I'm gonna talk about uh, my second chapter entitled Drivers of Cynosian Nebulosis and Cyanops Oscillatus Growth. Again, that's speckled trout and red drum respectively. So this chapter is focused on the variation we see in size at age for speckled sea trout and red drum. And for each of these two species, we see at each, size, at each age and sex, uh, the fish can be very different lengths. So the goal of this chapter is to identify drivers of variation in growth rates of these fish. Um, and this is important because growth rates affect the early survival of these fish, as well as how soon in their lives they enter the minimum slot size, which is the minimum length fish an angler is allowed to keep. And understanding what drives growth rates of these two important recreational fishery species will hopefully help us understand how they might respond physically um, to cl long-term climate change. So this figure on the right shows the growth curves for male and female speckled trout in coastal Alabama. And we can see a significant size and growth rate difference between the males, which are shown in red, and the females, which are shown in blue for speckled trout. So because of this, throughout this whole chapter, I will be analyzing males and females separately. Another thing we can see from this plot is that there is a wide range in size at age for both males and females. And for example, if you look at the four-year-old females, they range in size from about 425 millimeters to about 650 millimeters. And then if we look at the males at age four, they range from about 300 millimeters to 550 millimeters. And this is a huge disparity in size at age. So this chapter aims to identify, to understand what is driving these wide ranges in length at age. And red drum will also be included in this chapter and have similar trends in length at age for males and females. But since I started this analysis with speckled trout, I'm gonna be referring to them a lot throughout the presentation. But again, this whole analysis will be rerun on red drum. So now I'll get into the methods for chapter two. Um, so first I'd like to talk about what, um, what is an otolith. So otoliths are the ear bones of a fish and we extract these otoliths from the otic cavity and this sits just behind the brain. And fish use otoliths for balance and stability while they're swimming. But we as scientists use um, otoliths to estimate age and growth. And we do this by cutting a thin cross section of the bone. And we then mount that cross section of the otolith onto a slide. So with this thin cross section, we can see through the otolith and we can see these rings. And these rings or bands form annually for most fish. Um, and we sometimes call these annuli. So as the fish grows, the otolith grows with them and grows opaque layers during the winter months when growth is slow, which is what forms these dark bands. And the exact timing of when these dark bands start and stop depends on the species. Um, but we can use these rings to age the fish in kind of the same way that you can count tree rings on a tree stump to age the tree. So the fisheries assessment and monitoring program collects monthly gillnet samples. And they collect otoliths from many sport fish species in these samples to assess age and growth. Um, that BAMP program started pulling otoliths in the year 2000, so we currently have an otolith collection um, ranging from 2000 to 2017. Um, we also collected otoliths from the Alabama Deep Sea Fishing Rodeo. Uh, in 2021, we took speckled trout otoliths, and this year we took otoliths from both speckled trout and red drum. <clears throat> 
So for each of these otoliths, either I or someone at MRG cuts these thin sections and glues them to slides. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, from those sections, we can determine age and birth year based on when the fish was caught. So in this example, the fish was caught in August of 2005 and has four rings. This would mean that the fish was born in the year 2001, uh, sometime during the spawning season, which for speckled trout ranges from June through October. So in this study, we are estimating annual growth as being proportional to the annual otolith growth. So if we measure the distance from the core or the center of the otolith, which is marked here as a white dot, to the outer edge of the otolith, um, represented by that red dot, we then have a proportion of otolith size to total length when caught. And we can measure the distance to each ring and calculate the approximate length of the fish at each age. So the calculation would look something like this, where how much the fish grew in one year, um, here I'm calling this the index calculated growth, is equal to the distance from the last ring shown here, divided by the total rate otolith radius. And that gives us a the proportion of otolith growth, which we then multiply by the total length when caught to get the growth between 2003 and 2004 in this case. And we repeat this process to get annual growth for each year of the fish's life and can translate this into length at age when each ring was formed. And um, this method does assume that the otolith growth is proportional to the fish growth. And I will be testing this assumption as part of my methods. So this process gives us a database of annual growth and length at age for ages three and up. Um, and we are limited to ages three and up because the first ring on the otolith is unreliable. And so we can't measure growth from ages zero to one or one to two. Um, and the reason we can't estimate growth from ages zero to one is because the fish could have been born any time during that six month spawning period. And so we really don't know how much time has elapsed between the core and the first band. So to be cautious, we also do not count the first band as reliable and we start measuring at the second band. So again, the earliest we can estimate growth is the growth between ages two and three. So for this analysis, I'll calculate um, von Bertalampi growth curves for each cohort. And I'm doing this because the growth rate varies by age. And so we can only compare growth within the same age and sex. So by calculating um, cohort growth rates, we can see if cohorts exposed to the same environmental conditions at the same age have different growth rates when compared to another cohort at the same age that was exposed to different environmental conditions in a different year. And there are a few possibilities for what this might look like. So as a reminder, these growth curves um, will be starting at age two and a half, which captures the growth between ages two and three. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the example plot, uh, the variation in length at age could start at the beginning of the growth curve. And so the start points of the curves would be different. And this would indicate that the size is dependent on growth in the first year of life, which is not captured in this analysis. Or if you look at the right, the example plot on the right, um, the trajectories or growth rates could be different, but with the same starting point. And this means that the cohort starting, the co cohort starting out at the same length, but the differing growth trajectories indicate that the variation in growth is happening later in life. So again, in the example plot on the left, the cohorts are growing at the same rate, but start out at different sizes as determined by early growth. And in the example plot on the right, the cohorts start out at the same size, but grow at different rates. Of course, a third possibility is that both of these, both different start sizes and different growth rates um, could occur. But in any scenario, this could be a result from um, environmental drivers, prey, ability, prey, prey availability, or genetics. Um, in this study, I'm going to be including both environmental drivers and prey abundance as um, potential drivers. So in this analysis, I'm also going to model variation in growth using environmental factors and prey abundance as predictors. 
So first I'm going to correlate growth with single drivers. And these single drivers are going to include those environmental factors as well as prey abundance. Um, I'll then use multiple regression to create explanatory models of annual growth for speckled trout and red drum. And lastly, I'll be creating predictive models to assess potential future scenarios based on the relevant environmental, environmental factors and prey species uh, predictors identified. Um, so next I'm gonna get into the preliminary results for this chapter. Um, so this is a figure showing von Bertalanthi growth curves for the observed data in blue and the index calculated lengths in green, um, just for female Cynosia nebulosis uh, or speckled trout. So again, these index values start at about two and a half years. And because of this, the model doesn't really capture the full growth curve. But what we can see here is that the index calculated lengths fall in the same range as the observed lengths at age. Um, and so this indicates that our method for calculated index lengths is looking pretty good. Uh, in this plot, we can see male and female growth separated out by age and year. So we can compare growth within each year of different cohorts. And some of these sample sizes are fairly small, but um, they will grow once I add in the otoliths that are remaining in our catalog and haven't been measured yet. Um, but despite these small sample sizes, we can see some small differences in growth, particularly in the two to three year old females. So this figure shows von Bertalanthi growth curves for observed length, not index length, of speckled trout cohorts born from 2002 to 2010. And we can see that the females all seem to have the same start point with different trajectories, whereas some of the male cohorts have different start points. And again, this indicates that the um, in the females, um, the growth rate may vary at a later age in life, while in the males, it may be varying in the first year of life. Um, however, we do have sparse data at the older ages and additional data is needed to improve our model accuracy. So the next steps for this chapter are to add the remaining otoliths um, in our collection, uh, create these explanatory and predictive models and repeat the whole process for red drum. So this chapter calculates growth curves and models to assess drivers of speckled trout and red drum growth. And this research will hopefully help us understand what drives this huge variation in size at age in both of these species. Um, and understanding the key factors affecting growth rates of these important sport fish will help environmental managers or hopefully help envir environmental managers identify important environmental covariates, um, which are used in stock assessments, and generally give a better understanding of how long-term climate change will affect stock biomass. Um, it's also important to note that size of adult fish is directly related to fecundity, where larger females produce more eggs and therefore more young, um, and therefore growth rates do impact the average fecundity of the overall population, which in turn could affect the size of each new cohort. Um, so next I'll get into my third and final chapter, um, looking at environmental drivers of key species productivity. So productivity along with juvenile survival rates can be a primary driver of population size. And this chapter aims to identify drivers of variability and productivity in some key species. Um, but first I wanna talk about what is production. So production is the total weight gain of a cohort. Um, for example, let's say we have a cohort of trout at age one and their biomass, um, let's just say is equal to X. Now we fast forward one year at age two, that same cohort has grown in size and some of the fish have died off. So the total weight gain of this cohort is equal to the production. So the production is equal to the biomass of the cohort at age two minus the biomass of the cohort at age one and minus the biomass lost from mortality. Um, and production directly impacts the fishery by impacting how many pounds of harvest, harvestable fish or shrimp there are each year. 
And by identifying environmental drivers of variation in production, we can hopefully better understand how these stocks will respond um, to long-term changes in climate change. Um, so production is calculated using age, which um, as I described earlier is derived from otoliths, as well as length and abundance. And these are used to calculate biomass if that data is not already available. Next, I'll get into the methods for chapter three. So in this chapter, I'm going to be calculating the annual production for speckled trout, red drum, southern flounder, and pinnated shrimps. And these production estimates will be calculated using data from that same FAMP, uh, SANE, trawl, and gillnet samples, um, and which of these data sets we use will just depend on the species. So for example, the SANE data will be used for shrimp and juvenile fish, uh, while well, the gillnets are more effective sampling method for adult speckled trout and red drum. And I'll be using methods derived from Holloway et al. 2019 and Sabrina et al. 2020. And the main advantage of these methods is that they take into account the difference in densities based on habitat type where the animals were caught. And this just helps standardize these estimates across studies. So similar to the growth analysis, I am first going to correlate production with single drivers. Um, the single drivers, again, are going to be environmental factors and prey abundance. Um, and these will also be included as explanatory variables in the multiple regression. Um, and the multiple regression, again, will be used to create uh, explanatory models of annual production for each species. And lastly, predictive models will be um, created to assess potential future scenarios. And this is based on those relevant environmental uh, and prey species predictors identified previously in the analysis. So understanding drivers of production in key fishery species is really important to predicting stock sizes, which can hopefully aid in management decisions. Um, and that's why this chapter calculates annual production for four key fishery species and creates explanatory and predictive models to assess what drives variation in productivity for each species. And these models can um, hopefully be used in future stock assessments to help understand what drives good or bad years for a certain species so that uh, managers and fishermen um, can know what might happen to stocks in any given conditions. Um, so that's all I have for chapter three. So in summary, this dissertation identifies drivers of nectin community structure, key species growth, and key species productivity, and identifying what environmental factors mo most affect each of these things helps scientists and managers understand the impacts of long-term climate change on our local nectin. So not only will this work identify environmental drivers, but it will also create predictive models of growth and productivity, again, to hopefully aid ma in management decisions. And um, species-based approaches have a really important place in research and management, um, but environmental factors affect individual populations within the ecosystem, and then in turn, these populations affect one another. So by studying long-term changes at the ecosystem level, as I'm doing in this dissertation, um, we hopefully gain a fuller understanding of the dynamics at play. Um, so I'd like to, again, thank my committee, Ron Baker, John Lerder, Sean Powers, and Mindy Karanowskis. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my funding source and funded off of a NOAA Restore grant. I'd also like to thank the Alabama Deep Sea Fishing Rodeo JCs for allowing us to take samples at the fishing rodeo these past two years. And last but not least, I'd like to thank the whole Baker Lab for all of their hard work and support on this project, um, particularly co collecting those otoliths at the rodeo. That was a really huge effort. Mm -hmm.